All right, so I guess we can go ahead and um, start the last presentation of this series, uh, Meet Your Scientists. Um, uh, so welcome everybody to be he um, here. So it's really, uh, we're very happy to have you uh, on the last presentation. And I see that some of you guys have been also attending uh, the other webinars that we did with uh, the scientists at the lab. So this is uh, has been a great opportunity and uh, we hope we're going to maintain this with uh, more people joining us in the future, but it has been a great opportunity for um, us to learn uh, what are the research that the scientists has been doing here at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and also um, their pathway, how they actually um, happen to choose a scientific career and all the different obstacles or the different choices that they have been making over the time. I didn't introduce myself, I just realized, uh, but I'm Cristina Fernandez and I'm one of the educators here at the DNA Learning Center. Um, so the first thing I just want to mention for if there's anybody unfamiliar with what we do, uh, we do a lot of uh, hands-on experiment and activities and what you guys are seeing now is uh, our webpage uh, promoting uh, the summer camps that we are going to be having on site. Um, there's also some information about the new um, labs that are going to be open in Brooklyn very soon and also for the field trips that uh, we have the opportunity sometimes to work with you guys um, through your schools. Uh, so if you are interested, you can find a lot of information and definitely we are going to maintain these, um, these activities later on, all right? So without um, further ado, I'm going to just introduce our um, speaker today. It's Peter Koo, he's one of the assistant uh, professor here at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and he's going to talk about his uh, research um, in deep learning. So Peter, go ahead, it's all yours. And tell us something about you and your research. Thank you. Um, is everything good? You can hear me just fine? Okay, great. And um, well, thanks uh, Christine and Jason for, uh, you know, the introduction and for inviting me to give this talk today. Um, my name is Peter Ku, and I'm an assistant professor here at uh, the Simon Center for Quantitative Biology at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And uh, I'm very excited to tell you about my research today. And, you know, overall, my lab's research lies at the intersection of deep learning and gene regulation, uh, with some fringe interest in using AI to learn the language of proteins. But to start, I thought I'd tell you um, a little bit about myself. <clears throat> so I'm originally from the West Coast, Los Angeles, LA, born and raised. Now, if you just saw the endpoints of my journey thus far, it really doesn't capture the long uh, and non-traditional path that I took to get here. Now, I'd like to tell you that my origin story began when I was a child, carrying a magnifying glass, inspecting everything just fascinated by nature. And this is a picture that most people have of scientists. They were, you know, born to be scientists. I guess, you know, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a, an outlier in this regard. Uh, and that's because, you know, as far as I can recall, I wasn't the best kid academically. Now, ever since the first grade, uh, while all of the other kids would be uh, running around and playing during recess, I was always uh, stuck at the benches writing standards. And uh, this is very similar to the way in this cartoon, Bart Simpson is uh, repeatedly writing the same sentence on the chalkboard. But for me, it was more along the lines of, I will not disturb others in class. And this wasn't just you know, this one-time deal, but really embodied my whole young elementary school experience. Uh, you know, eventually I started high school. And at this point, I'd like to tell you that you know, this was the moment that everything changed for me. You know, I, I'd like to tell you that, you know, this is when reality kicked in and I became mature and uh, I got my act together and started to focus in school. And this was a period that, you know, in my life that I fell in love with science. Unfortunately, I can't. Um, and here's actually an actual report card of my first semester in high school. You can see that I received numerous Fs and Ds. I did receive a good grade in weight training and in Korean. And, and just to be clear, my parents only speak to me in Korean. 
So, you know, embarrassingly, I, I received an F in biology in ninth grade. And now this isn't even an AP bio or some college prep version. And my second semester was no different. I received uh, another 1.5 GPA again. And this was actually at another high school because I was expelled for reasons I won't get into today. Now, I, I was really an angsty teenage boy taking a little bit longer in life to grow up. So by the end of high school, the majority of my close friends didn't go, to, go off to college. They went directly to the workforce. Most of them work, um, chose to work at auto body shops because they loved to work on cars throughout high school. But you know, I hated it. Uh, and my dad owned an auto body shop. And every time I wasn't in school because of a suspension or something, I would have to work there. And you know, I, I worked there quite a number of times. So I already knew that this was not for me. Now, with no real good options after high school, I joined the US Army Reserves. And so I went to training uh, in Georgia for about a year. Afterwards, I came back to Southern California and I enrolled at a local community college. Now, while most people spend about two years in community college, I spent four years. And this was really necessary because I messed up so bad in high school, I had to play catch up for about two years. I failed algebra in high school and never took trigonometry. And there was a lot of math you know, that I basically needed to catch up on in addition to other subjects like English and literature. After working hard, I eventually transferred to UC Berkeley for my upper division courses, uh, majoring in physics. And uh, I, I graduated with high honors. And then um, I then moved on to Yale uh, to get a PhD in physics. But after two years, I, I left the program to go to business school for financial engineering. And this is school um, to become a quant and work on Wall Street. Um, but I quickly found out that I'm not motivated by money. And so I, 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 after I graduated, I, I went back to finish up my PhD at Yale. And, um, but I will say one good thing that came out of going to business school was that I met my wife there. Now, after finishing up my PhD, I moved on to Harvard, where I transitioned from experimental physics to computational biology. And after a few years of doing this, I find myself here at uh, Cold Spring Harbor. So what changed? Well, the big inflection point really came when I joined the US Army Reserves. Um, boot camp really straightened me out. Um, it taught me about responsibility, motivation, and dedication. And it taught me to stop setting limits for myself and that I can achieve any goal I set my mind to. And uh, here's a picture of me um, you know, uh, in, with my platoon at the time. And uh, I'm here uh, on the bottom left. And so you know, I put that experience from the US Army to practice at community college. I worked hard in classes. I made lots of sacrifices. Instead of hanging out with friends all day, I was studying, doing extracurriculars. Um, here's an article on the front page of my uh, community college's newsletter in 2004. It features me winning um, the Barry Goldwater Scholarship. And this is a pretty prestigious award for undergrads doing research. You can see this highlighted here uh, that I received a grant um, from the National Society of Physics Students to build a cosmic ray detector. And I suppose this is when my interest in research really began. And you know, here's a picture of me at the time and don't mind my hair in this photo. Uh, you know, I swear it was pretty cool back then. So uh, even after transferring to UC Berkeley, I continued to do research throughout the academic year. And every summer, I would come back home to LA and work at Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the low temperature physics lab. And I did this for uh, two summers. And I just loved being in the lab. Getting something done in the lab, even if it was very simple, was just so gratifying. And in the low temperature physics lab there, um, there are lots of cryogens. And my experiment required us to go down to temperatures of 0 0.3 Kelvin. And this temperature is colder than space. Uh, and so here's a fun picture of me outside of the lab where um, there was this warning sign for toxic asphyxiating gases. Now, during my PhD, this was a period in my life that, um, that I became a much more well-rounded scientist. And as an experimental physicist, I designed and built my own experiments. 
circuits, electronics, data acquisition software, the, the works. And these two pictures at the top show um, this setup that I built. It's called an optical tweezers, and it has fluorescence microscopy capabilities. And it, it was, you know, a lot of fun to design and build. And for those of you who don't know what an optical tweezers is, it's when you shine um, when you shine a high powered laser through a microscope objective, it can magically trap micron sized beads at its focus. These beads are just round spheres made up of latex or some plastic. And for those of you in the audience that have taken a physics course before, uh, I'm sure at some point during the course you were probably complaining, you know, why do I have to study so many springs? Well, it turns out that these um, that this optical tweezer holds on to this small bead uh, in the center of that uh, laser focus like it's attached to a spring. Now, to make this a little bit more interesting, we can do some biochemistry on the bead so that we can attach biological matter like DNA to it. And then we can start manipulating the DNA strand to study its mechanical responses to forces. In other words, we can stretch it, unwind it, unzip it, and so on. Now, during grad school, one of the major challenges for me was that I had two of my oldest kids towards the end of it. And this was definitely not easy at the time. But in hindsight, it, it was totally worth it because, you know, we can take these uh, sorts of funny photos, uh, you know, like this here on the left. And just a little over two months ago, I was gifted my third child. And so I'm basically back to the point where things aren't so easy anymore again. And um, here's a picture uh, taken last month of where my uh, one week old son is leaping on me. So after my PhD, I moved on to Harvard to do a postdoc. And I changed fields from physics to um, the intersection of AI and computational genomics. And I loved it so much that this is still the main focus of my current research. So let me tell you a little bit more about it. Now, you've probably heard uh, about this AI revolution that's currently taking place and how it's going to change the world. Now, while the hype in the media is certainly overblown, there has been a lot of impressive progress over the past five to eight years. For instance, deep learning has become a world-class player at the game Go. Uh, it can generate video footages of Obama uh, saying things that he never said before. Google has released a visual machine translation system. Uh, and this application takes an image segments uh, different objects and classifies what they what those objects are. And you can see how this is this application is useful for things like you know robotics and self-driving cars. But this last application also scares me a bit because it reminds me of a scene from a movie I saw a long time ago called The Terminator. And if you saw this movie, you know it's not going to end well for humans. Now I don't know if you saw this meme going around recently on Twitter, but it says that, you know, the box office movie that was the number that was number one on your 10th birthday is how the rest of your 2021 will turn out for you. Now, I, I was born on July 27, 1990, 1981. And so my 10th birthday, the top movie, um, the top box office movie, according to Wikipedia, was Terminator 2. Um, so, you know, uh oh. Anyways, um, so what is deep learning? Deep learning started out really a, a, as a rebranding of uh, artificial neural networks in 2012. Um, but, you know, artificial neural networks have been around uh, even before the 80s. Um, but the field has undergone an explosion this past decade primarily due to advances in computer hardware and the big data era. Here, I'll briefly walk through what a basic artificial neural network is. And the basic component of a neural network is a neuron. Here on the top left, uh, this artificial neuron takes input data and performs some nonlinear transformation. And we can create a network of these simple artificial neurons and organize them into layers. Since we want our network 
to be able to perform interesting computations, we need an input layer where we can feed in data, and we need an output layer where we can get the results of the computation. Um, and yeah, and, and, and here, um, there's only a single output neuron. And the intervening layers are called hidden layers because we don't directly observe their activity. Now, a neural network like this is considered a universal function approximator. And that's because it can relate any inputs to outputs with some approximate function that it learns during training. But it's not straightforward how to access what function it's learned. So for this reason, neural networks are largely considered a black box. Even still, we can train this neural network to perform interesting computations like classify images of chihuahuas and muffins. Or we can use the same network to classify labradoodles and fried chicken. Now, since this is a universal function approximator that can take any inputs and relate them to, to, to any outputs, we can use the same network and train it to classify whether a protein sequence belongs to a given protein family. And biological systems are, are very challenging to study because they rely on so many complex interactions. Take, for instance, this cartoon diagram of a promoter complex for gene expression. There are many proteins here shown in a different color, and they're interacting with both the DNA as well as with each other. If we want to build an accurate mathematical model for this biological system, then we need to know who the players are, where they bind along the DNA, how strongly they bind to the DNA, and with each other. Of course, different genes use different promoter sequences, which use different sets of transcription factors, so different proteins. So writing some kind of analytical equation for this general system of gene expression is very challenging. Problems like this exemplify why deep learning is such an attractive approach, because a deep learning model is a powerful function approximator that can autonomously learn features. So in principle, um, it can be trained on just DNA sequences, and it can learn a function that captures the binding patterns of each of these proteins, their locations, their binding strengths, and higher order dependencies between each of these proteins. <clears throat> Indeed, deep learning shows great promise to revolutionize data analysis for genomics and precision medicine. One area that interests me is on understanding the functional impact of mutations in the non-coding region of the genome, which is where gene regulatory elements primarily reside. The basic approach taken by me, and as well as many other researchers in this field, is to train a deep learning model on genomic sequences and have it learn an associated regulatory function um, uh, for those sequences, and these are, you know, experimental, uh, experimentally measured um, functions such as transcription factor binding. And right now there are thousands of these kinds of experiments. And rather than analyze each one at a time, we can use deep learning to simultaneously learn from all of them. Now, if this deep learning model is capable of making accurate predictions, then we can employ it to predict new sequences that have mutations. And this can help us to inform which mutations affect these regulatory functions that the model was trained on. And in principle, this should help us to understand the functional consequences of disease-associated variants. Uh, the basic idea is that we can query the model to see if a mutation will change the model's predictions. And, and, and we can see which of those predictions are affected. And this can provide insight into which regulatory function that the mutation affects. And this can help us to you know, prioritize you know, which of the hundreds of thousands of disease-associated mutations are worth follow-up experimental validation. And you know, the broader aim of this would be to um, identify potential therapeutic targets. And uh, deep learning methods are making uh, a big impact in computational biology, 
Um, here are just a few of many applications. It can predict transcription factor binding sites. It can score mutations in protein sequences and even predict protein structures now. While many of these applications are very exciting because they show that a deep learning model provides more accurate predictions than uh, you know, the previous uh, methods, um, their main drawback is that it's difficult to understand why they make their predictions. So this begs the question, should we trust their predictions? In biology, we want to understand what our models are learning. This is why we tend to gravitate towards more interpretable mechanistic models. And mechanistic models are those that tell us exactly what is interacting with what in a very transparent way, explicitly modeling all of the underlying biology. But in the regime of big, noisy, and high-dimensional biological sequence data, it's not always clear what all of the signals are and how they vary. So it can be challenging to develop a mechanistic model that provides a similar you know, state-of-the-art predictions as deep neural networks. When it comes down to it, you really can't deny the impressive performance of deep learning in so many of these applications in biology and healthcare. So there seems to be this trade-off between an easy to interpret mechanistic model, but that provides weaker predictions, and a difficult to interpret deep learning model that provides better predictions. My research aims to bridge these two approaches for genomics. My philosophy is that we should embrace the powerful function approximation capabilities of deep learning to learn relevant features in big noisy genomic data sets. Then we can interrogate what our models are learning to interpret what they have learned. And this can help us provide you know, insights into the underlying biology. And in turn, this can help us to design more accurate and robust mechanistic models. <coughs> And there's a quote from a famous physicist, Richard Feynman, who once said, you know, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And this quote really resonates with me and what we strive for in my lab. So he here's a cute little example that highlights why it's really important um, to understand what deep learning models are learning. Here's a neural network um, that's trained to classify wolves and huskies. But rather than learning the features of the animals, that is, you know, what makes up a that what makes a husky a husky and how that's different from a wolf, such as you know, something like a head shape or ears, um, this model learns to classify these images based on background scenery instead, uh, the snow and the grass. And this can happen when the data set used for training mainly contains bias. Uh, such as, you know, pictures of wolves only during winter and pictures of huskies only during the springtime. So a model like this will perform very poorly when it comes across new data where a wolf is now on grass and the husky is on snow. Neural networks are notorious for exploiting flaws in data sets. So it's crucial to validate what these networks have learned so that we can, you know, eventually trust their predictions. The way we do this in practice um, is we introduce some kind of intervention or perturbation to the data, and we monitor how much the model's prediction changes in response to that perturbation. In genomics, a natural perturbation is a mutation. A mutation by itself is rather arbitrary, um, but we can you know, start to gain real insights if we you know, perhaps systematically mutate each position with all possible you know, nucleotides. And we do this for every single position in that sequence. And we monitor how the model's prediction changes in response to these mutations. And this can help to identify important positions in the sequence. They're the ones where the model's prediction changes um, dramatically when a mutation is applied. And, and, and the ones that do are likely to be very important versus uh, the positions that are, are less sensitive, you know, where no matter what mutation is introduced, the predictions don't change at all. And these sorts of mutagenesis experiments are precisely what experimentalists do 
also to identify the important positions in the genome, but they do this in the laboratory. And in essence, we, we're using our deep learning model to perform similar experiments, but instead of the laboratory, we do our experiments all in silico um, on the computer. And we use the predictions of the model as a proxy for wet lab measurements. And this helps us to try many things out that would otherwise take days or months to do in the wet lab. So we can really quickly prototype a bunch of different experiments that wet lab biologists would, would love to do. And my other research areas, um, you know, interests are, are to design um, deep learning models so that they're intrinsically interpretable and more trustworthy overall. Um, and here's just a cartoon example um, where, you know, where we would like to have you know, the neurons in the neural network, uh, in this case, it's the brain, to learn uh, something called local features. Uh, local features means that each neuron learns to recognize something very important and uh, recognizable to a human. And in this case, uh, we have two different neurons. Each neuron is learning either a grandma or a cat. So to understand what the neuron has learned, you just have to look at the neuron itself and see what causes it to activate. In the bottom scenario, multiple neurons collaborate to recognize the grandma and the cat. And, and, and you know, many of these neurons are overlapping too. So this makes it difficult to understand what drives a neuron's activity uh, because so many things will cause that uh, any given neuron to, to activate. So half of my lab works on this kind of deep learning interpretabilities um, to you know, design more interpretable networks, while the other half applies these models to better understand gene regulation. And I, I just wanna say that um, I, I really love what I do. Um, uh, although as a scientist, you know, science reigns supreme, there, there are so many other aspects to the life of science that I simply love. Um, I love the interactions we have, teaching graduate students, um, uh, lots of uh, social activities, um, like this picture on the top right where we're going hiking. And in the top left, these are students learning to pick locks in my office. And here is the rest of my lab. Um, the makeup is uh, grad student heavy, but we also train outstanding high school students. Um, if you're interested, I highly recommend you apply for the Partners for the Future program. Um, if you're a junior going on to becoming a senior. And uh, thank you for listening to my presentation. And, um, you know, just to explain what you're looking at here, this is uh, an AI application that came out in 2015. And it was, you know, when it came out, it was just one of the coolest things. Um, it's called Neural Style Transfer. And it basically takes an object from one image, uh, in this case, a picture of Cold Spring Harbor, and the artistic style of another image. Uh, these are the smaller um, pictures on the bottom right of each of these um, images. And um, it takes artistic style from that image and merges them together. And that's what you're seeing here. And this is essentially CSHL reimagined by different iconic artists. Uh, Thank you again uh, for listening. I'm happy to take any questions.